All right, I think we can get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining today's lunchtime art talk, which, as many of you know, is a weekly series led by Hammer curators on works from our collection. This series uh, will focus on artists. This current series will focus on artists featured in Made in LA of Version, as the galleries are unfortunately closed to the public due to the pandemic. We thought it was important to highlight works by these incredible artists selected for this year's biennial. My name is Nicholas Barlow. I'm a curatorial assistant at The Hammer, and I'll be facilitating this afternoon's talk on Buck Ellison. Uh, joining me today is my colleague, uh, curatorial assistant Nika Chilowicz, uh, who will be helping me answer your questions later in the program. A few Zoom notes before we begin. Uh, when the presentation starts, please select speaker view in the top right corner of your screen and in the top middle of your screen, please click view options to ensure side by side and fit to window. Those are all in quotes in my little script. Uh, please note that today's program is being recorded. You have the option to toggle your camera on and off using the camera icon in the bottom lower left corner when you're whatever you're most comfortable with. You'll remain on mute until the end of the presentation, at which point Nika will help me unmute those who have questions. During the presentation, if you have any questions for myself or for Nika, including any technical issues, uh, you can ask those using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I think we can begin the program. So let's get the slides up. Buck Ellison is a Los Angeles-based artist who produces meticulously crafted and detailed images that examine white American wealth and power. On their surface, his photographs and films mildly reproduce the habits and tastes of affluent families, WASP dynasties, and Ivy League students. However, lurking beneath this facade is a deep inquiry into how whiteness and wealth are sustained and broadcast. Ellison's images borrow from a vocabulary of stock photography and commercial advertising. His images offer oblique and uncanny depictions of lifestyles and subjects, which are often hidden from public view. Couched within mundane and polite tableaus of domestic scenes and family portraiture, Ellison's semi-documentary photography investigates signs and symbols of the elite, playing close attention to cultural signifiers and loaded gestures. Influenced by 17th century Dutch family portraiture, Ellison's images hold precise clues that speak to wealth, systemic inequality, and dark histories of violence entrenched in American upper, the American upper class. Today, I'll be going through some of Ellison's earlier work and discussing his practice in general, and then I'll be focusing on this work here, the Prince Children Hall in Michigan, 1975, in greater detail. Next slide. Ellison was born in San Francisco. He received his BA in German literature at, at Columbia University and received his MFA at Staatsschule in Frankfurt. Uh, he was raised in an atmosphere and an environment not unlike some of his subjects, which is to say he had access, access to spaces of wealth, and he was well -versed in the, is well versed in the codes and manners of the upper and middle and upper middle class. Through photography, Ellison often distills his own experiences to analyze a subject matter and a world he is, he is partly embedded within. Yet by placing them at a slight distance, toying with and emphasizing a sometimes surreal uh, verisimilitude, his images feel and read like ads and reality simultaneously. Ellison's photography practice is heavily research-based and detail-oriented. He offers, he often, he will work on a project or a series over a period of years to gather material, to shoot, then to edit heavily. He assist, insists on taking his time. Next slide. Ellison's series, Hotchkiss versus Taft, looks at a female lacrosse game between two East Coast private boarding schools in Connecticut. These schools were founded in the late 19th century to prepare men for Ivy League University. They are highly competitive and deep rivals with each other when it comes to sports. This scene, this world, uh, interested Ellison for several reasons. Within it, 
uh, a multitude of complex layers is present. Lacrosse is a sport played by the upper class. It is a status symbol. And women's lacrosse is often billed, and uh, billed as encouraging female empowerment. Lacrosse, however, uh, originates from a variety of stickball games played by Native American tribes throughout the United States and Canada. The Iroquois called it the little brother of war and used it as a means to work out conflict between tribes and groups. The game was adopted by European settlers who created complicated rules to exclude the natives from cooperation and play. Additionally, Ellison was drawn to the impressive, uh, impressive athleticism and the permission in this sport for women to behave violently. Next slide. Yeah. Ellison spent years mulling over this project before actually shooting any images. He chose the specific schools to, to speak not only towards the wealth and power and this kind of access to the governing classes, but also a dark, violent colonial past. Hotchkiss was founded by the Hotchkiss family who manufactured rifles that would be used to massacre the native populations and, fought, and force them from their land. You can see the image on the right, this focus on the black ground and this gesture towards landscape. Next slide. Hotchkiss versus Taft was shot in a documentary style with Ellison taking on the role of a pseudo sports photographer. In recent years, Ellison's practice has, involved, uh, has evolved to incorporate much more control over his images. Though at an initial read, this may not seem to be the case. Take this image, Cheeseboard from 2016. A couple stand in a fine goods store and look at an expensive wooden cheese board. Though it seems to be a fleeting moment or a snapshot, the image is actually meticulously staged. The subjects are models hired by Ellison through a casting agency. Working with a stylist, the models are wearing a costume. The location was scouted and permissions acquired. Everything within the image, every gesture is loaded. Every, everything in the image is thought through and every gesture is loaded. The photography, this photograph is coated with signs of wealth speckled throughout. Look at this, note this man's Patagonia hat, which perhaps gestures towards a sort of privileged liberalism and gestures towards a kind of resources to travel or outdoorsy, perhaps of the peyote ceremony vacation Silicon Valley ilk. Her Yankee hat that perhaps speaks towards the coastal elite shuffle from New York to California. Fleece on fleece on fleece on fleece. Commercial images as they exist in the world do not demand our close inspection. They often work on a more subliminal manner, playing off of our desires and insecurities. Ellison's work blurs the line between documentary and commercial image, between self and advertised lifestyle. Additionally, it's important to note that to be able to read these codes within his work, these symbols, also speaks towards a kind of embroilment within the world, it places us in a negotiation, which is if we can decode it, we must have access or proximity to something close to it. The artist has referred to this as a legibility game. There is a reason you can read it. To that note, while I was preparing this presentation, I got... Uh, quite amused with his image because in reading it, I started to recognize the location as a uh, Heath ceramics. Uh, but in reading a kind of essay about Ellison, someone placed the Heath ceramics in San Francisco, which means that I was reading it as the Heath ceramics in Los Angeles, which means I was reading the codes of the kind of design that Heath ceramics gives off. And then I understood that. And that kind of speaks very much to the point. Um, next slide. Many of these images are based off of Ellison's memories of his own youth or moments that resonated with the artist. Near invisible exchanges that often happen so quickly, Ellison has turned to staging to make them visible. But it is impressive how much discomforting critique is contained within these nuanced images. They are slippery. 
They mimic a form of individualism as sold to and broadcast by white upper class. To Ellison, it is this tension between wanting to look and feeling guilty about it once you have that he is interested in. This image on the right is, is important to note in that sense, this image called Pro, where you have this young girl sitting and making protest posters. Next slide. A major influence on Ellison's work is 17th century Dutch family portraiture. Dutch painters from this time and this kind of golden era of Dutch painting uh, created a complex and thoughtful scene created complex and thoughtful scenes of signifiers placed within images, which recorded actual events and luxuries owned by their subjects, but also allegorized the lives of the, the presented subjects. While shooting um, and working with these models, Ellison often refers to a gesture book he has um, of paintings and advertisements that kind of hold within it hold within the gestures a feeling he is going for. So he can kind of reference to emulate and incorporate. That said, he gives the models little direction besides slight kind of speaking towards gesture, letting them live in the costumes and interact with their props, waiting for a breakdown of artifice. And also he shoots for several hours, um, kind of exhaustedly photographing and re-photographing the subjects over and over and over again um, to kind of further break down this. He, he, he considers this kind of akin to a performance documentation. Uh, documentation. Uh, Ellison shoots digitally, taking many photographs of his subjects and then edits them together to create a composite. This composite image is then presented as the final image. By the way, this is untitled Christmas card, um, an image that I've spent a lot of time kind of looking at. And I just wanna say that these, this family, this kind of impeccably beautiful, family is, is truly terrifying. Next slide. This brings us to the Prince family. The Prince children, Holland, Michigan, 1975, 2019, is a staged and imagined family portrait of a powerful and influential American family. Though it is contemporary, it takes place in the past. Featured within it are a young Betsy DeVos and Eric Prince, two major figures of right-wing America and global politics. Betsy is the former United States Secretary of Education. Her brother, Eric, is an American businessman, former US Navy SEAL, and the founder of the private military company, Blackwater. For the last few years, Elson has become fascinated with Betsy DeVos and her family lineage. A family uh, with wealth beyond comprehension and with, which holds so much power and sway in American politics. Yet their power and in many ways their image or how much control and how much money is hidden from us. The DeVos and Prince families, separate families merged together with Betsy, uh, are notoriously secretive. And kind of famously so, do not have family portraits. They don't have family photographs or Christmas cards in that sense, but actually we're part of a tradition of having family portraits painted of them. So Ellison became very fascinated by this idea of what does it mean to create a family portrait, a Christmas card-like family image of the children placed in a time using photography. How can we learn from this? Ellison began his project with a core interest with how people like Betsy and Eric were formed. In preparing for his DeVos and Prince series, Ellison researched through uh, the family foundations of the Prince and DeVos family, uh, all of their philanthropic uh, uh, givings, uh, the charities they gave to. He went through tax disclosures and financial disclosures, trying to understand the extent of this one power's uh, family's power this kind of network in which they, they breed, trying to understand wealth and how it forms and what it breeds. Next slide. If there's a central character to this project, it, it is Betsy who fascinates Ellison. 
When he talks or rock, uh, kind of uh, talks about Betsy, he, he refers to her as so, as Betsy. I think he spent a lot of time trying to figure out who she is, and that must have created a kind of close familiar, a, a semi-familiarity or intimacy with her. There's a caricature about Betsy DeVos that the media portrays uh, that she's an idiot, but most likely this is not true. Most likely she is, she is actually quite, quite smart, um, which makes it so much more horrifying and malicious. In her time of working for the Trump administration, she was an ardent anti-teacher unionist, working under the auspice of school choice and championing charter schools and religious schools in an attempt to dismantle the Department of Education from within. There's very few photographs of Betsy from her youth, very few photographs of Eric from her youth as well. So to pull these images, he took what he could. He found, uh, Ellison found uh, uh, yearbook images and kind of things to start to suture together a narrative life that he could kind of mold into a photo. Next slide. In Dick and Betsy, the Ritz-Carlton, Dallas, Texas, 1984, from 2019, we see a similarly fabricated space. It is an attempt to emulate or simulate a fleeting moment that the artist is imagining between Betsy DeVos and her now husband, uh, Richard DeVos. So Betsy Prince married Richard DeVos. Richard DeVos was the heir to the Amway fortune, a company called, stands for the American Way. Um, this was a merger of two immensely powerful Michigan families. Though it is said that Betsy is, is truly the real political animal here. And I like that Ellison showed her in this kind of casual possible vacation or in a hotel room. You see her in this kind of summer dress, pregnant. You see Dick in the background with boat shoes. But you have her just laying into someone on the phone, just truly screaming at someone. And I like this idea because there's this presentation that uh, Betsy DeVos gives off people like Betsy DeVos too, and which is a highly controlled image. They have lawyers and attorneys and accountants and everyone working for them to control a family image. And here Ellison is taking that and in some ways placing it to show a kind of, uh, 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 I guess a violence present. Uh, Ellison worked with, uh, Ellison worked with uh, uh, models. Uh, he had worked with a stylist. He placed tanner on the model's legs because Betsy DeVos is always very impeccably tanned. And he photographed them in this hotel room for a long period of time until they began to start to break down this artifice and start to live in, in their characters. Next slide. Eric is portrayed here with tiny little soldiers. As a child, he was obsessed with the Revolutionary War, especially the story of how American army, the American army hired German private soldiers to assist. This information is based off of reading his autobiography, Civilian Heroes, which Buck Ellison highly recommends. Eric was described as a youth as a proudly straight-laced kid who, without being asked, would put away soccer balls after practice. Next slide. Prince worked at the White House as a White House intern during George H.W. Bush's administration and was a Navy SEAL. But he's most famous for, and probably kind of, uh, I, I mean, what will be his, his claim to fame is the formation of Blackwater Worldwide in 1997, a private security and military, military contractor firm. Um, Prince bought 6,000 acres of the Great Dismal Swamp of North Carolina and set up a school for special operations. The name Blackwater comes from a, this peat-colored bog in which the school is located. Now, Blackwater has a really complicated and dark history, uh, in, especially in Iraq, where many soldiers went rogue and started just killing innocent civilians. Prince is also the owner of cobalt mines, which are minerals used in microchips and which are often run with slave, child slave labor. He's attached to very many kind of uh, malicious aspects of kind of a military industrial complex. But this image, instead, Ellison decides to pick, depict him in this moment of calm with a cat 
and a kind of meditation and almost insular, even though he is wearing a bulletproof vest, which once again speaks towards this violence. I like that this image is, is it might capture this strange character who is obsessed with manners and who is raised in a kind of Calvinist upbringing, but is also capable of true, true atrocity. Next slide. Ellison, after photographing these models who are portraying the Prince children for a long period of time, over and over and over again, photographing them, um, then doctored the image to create a composite image. And then he also further doctored the, doctored the image, Prince and uh, 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 Betsy, uh, uh, Eric and Betsy, uh, slowly manipulating and manipulating uh, in Photoshop their facial features to, to look closer to what they looked like when they were younger. He also added these tiny details. He slightly tinted the hair of the sisters uh, green because he knew that they were uh, competitive swimmers. He also speckled throughout the image kind of codes, codes that speak not only towards their upbringing, but towards their future. You see the military figures that Eric is playing with. You have the kind of plaid color and the skirts that speak towards the kind of private schools and religious schools in which they were going to, as grew up and going to. You see this porcelain, you see the rugs, you see a house that is modestly wealthy, but is definitely wealthy. All of this is coded and it's embedded in this image that strikes you as strange at first, but upon reading, there are all of these clues that emerge. But instead of grotesque parody, it is oblique and nuanced. It is a, 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 a subtle application of an ideology of violence in which Betsy DeVos and Eric Prince were raised. And I think this is really the strength, one of the strengths of an image like this. It is, does not rely on a kind of grotesqueness. It is subtle because it is trying to present something that needs to be presented, which is that this is a very much an American narrative. And this is very much about our country. And it is very much kind of present. It is dark and uncomfortable. And it is something that we must pay close attention to and examine and sit with it. So with that, I think we're gonna turn over to questions. Um, sorry for going a little long on that. Um, and I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, Nika. Hi, thank you, Nick. That was an amazing presentation. Definitely gave me trauma flashbacks to my New England prep school days. Uh, we will now begin answering some of your questions. Again, you can ask questions through the Zoom chat feature located at the bottom of your screen, or you can ask questions verbally. To ask a verbal question, please either raise your hand like this, or raise your hand by clicking on participants at the bottom of your screen and then clicking on the raise hand icon. I'll call you and unmute your mic so you can ask um, your question. So I just have an initial question and this may be really basic, but um, it, what if there is a reaction from the different families that Buck Ellison portrays, like, is there a reaction from them? Are they aware of these? Is there a tension that ensues? Um, I don't know how much I can talk to that. I can say that I know uh, because of an interview um, uh, with Allison or kind of reading reading about uh, that he he tried to follow uh, Betsy DeVos on Instagram, but never received a, uh, a, a request back or permission to do so. So don't know about that. Um, but at the same time, um, I think that this tension in this game in the sense of playing with kind of depictions of wealth from the space of kind of access to that wealth and that idea that kind of implicating the viewer into that is, is really interesting and, and quite discomforting in a, in a very fascinating, very kind of, uh, um, yeah, strong way. It really, the series really reminds me of a series of the Mexican wealthy elite called Ricas y Famosas. Mm. But in that case, where the artist also had access to extreme wealth, in that case, she was like driven out of the country and can't go back. So it's interesting <laughs> to see that there's just isn't that reaction from. Yeah, from yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's very interesting to compare him and place Buck within kind of other photographers, because I think that uh, I think he's been compared a lot to kind of Tina Barney. Uh, but Barney is 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 very much, I'd say, much more straightforward and this kind of privileged space being offered to us as art. And I think that there's much something much more. Uh, definitely much more conceptual, but much more kind of sneaky and slippery happening within Buck's images. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. 
Um, Janet has a question. Uh, can you be explicit, read the type of violence for the Prince children? I'm not sure. Uh, I would highly recommend actually reading. Um, there's a great Vanity Fair piece on the Prince family, the Prince DeVos family that came out a few years ago. Um, there's a lot of really good writing on them. I mean, inherent within the family is a little confusing because I can't really speak to that. Um, I, I don't know about that. But it's this idea that you have this family that grew up in this very strict kind of religious uh, upbringing and this very kind of mannered, powerful kind of uh, uh, manner of way of life who, who have caused so much damage, uh, not only to our country, but true violence at, throughout the world. Um, I mean, Eric Prince is, 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 is not a good person. Um, and, uh, I think that's something that you should definitely look into, I would say, but I definitely recommend that Vanity Fair article. Um, I, we have another question also about this violence, but I, I just, I echo what you said, Nick, that like, I think it's more a, an exploration of and amusing on and sort of a troubled engagement with how could you yeah. know how these yeah. institutions of violence who can actually grow up and support them and and create well, that, a, a I mean that's really I think the core thing is that Ellison is really interested in in, in institutions and not exactly just kind of uh, uh, you know governmental institutions or school but kind of the, the institution of the family and things like that so he's really interested in kind of how institutions kind of can can form people and by the kind of close examining of kind of family models or family interactions you have this kind of way to understand and place people and once again it is this idea that uh, the the kind of secretive, wealthy kind of mannered upbringing of the Prince film, uh, pr uh, the Prince family um, has to be juxtaposed with this kind of great uh, 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 kind of trauma they've enacted across upon the United States and the globe. And so those things have to sit together and they sit together kind of, un they have to sit together uncomfortably, I would have to say. Um, John has a question sort of to that end. Uh, if we didn't know the backstory of the portrait of the children, we say the same things about it. I think that's a fantastic question. I think that one of the things is when you address the work uh, initially without any information, there is a kind of eeriness to it. Um, there is a kind of um, a secret gnawing maliciousness and malaise that kind of sits behind the images. Um, uh, and as you gain information, it starts to kind of transform. Um, once again, this is kind of read like how you would read a kind of Dutch 17th century painting uh, or how you would read a kind of, uh, 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 you know, a John Singer Sargent painting, the idea that there are coded things that are kind of coded signs of wealth, but also speak towards the narrative that is playing out in the image as well. I don't know if I mentioned too, but the big thing is that, so the Prince family and the DeVos family works um, are featured at the Hammers display. They're going to be featured at Made in LA. So when we open up, hopefully at some point soon, uh, or in the near future, you can see those in person. And, and that's really kind of exciting because all of the details really, um, you get to explore them and spend time with them. Um, do, does anybody have another question? No? Charles? Ask this question because uh, uh, when you look at older paintings, you know, they're talking in a in a system that had, you know, royalty and divine rights of king. And it was the invention of money that made it possible for equality to set in among people who did not otherwise have aristocracy or, or positions uh, imposed upon them because of how they were born. And th there seems to be a struggle in that, what is best? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think Allison's really interested in this mutation of power and this kind of entrenchment of power and kind of white power within America, how it's um, and white supremacy within America attached to that and how, um, you know, power doesn't really go away. It just mutates. It really kind of transforms into and kind of is placed in different kind of spaces. Um, I think one of the interesting things I do want to note is that Allison you know, in, in this hyper intensive research to try to understand who the Prince family was and who the DeVos family was, and to try to create clothes that mimic as close as possible to what they would have been wearing at that time. Um, he's found it really important to kind of uh, follow the youngest children of the Prince family and DeVos family on, on social media. Um, because if, if the kind of eldest members of the family 
uh, are highly secretive. This new generation is not. And so they're giving us a window into this kind of area of wealth that has never really been seen before as well. Um, so it's the codes are also kind of present in that as well. I'll also note that um, if you want to read the Vanity Fair article, it's, you can find it in the chat. Yeah, I would highly um, recommend that. So if there are no other questions, I guess we'll close. Um, does anybody else have any question or comment or concern? No? No. Thanks okay. so much, guys. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I think that's all we have time for questions today. Uh, thank you so much for joining this afternoon and a uh, special thank you to Bank of America for presenting Made in LA 2020 Aversion. Uh, to support programs uh, like this in the future, we invite you to become a Hammer member or donate to the museum, visiting us at hammer.ucla.edu slash support. Be sure to join us next week's Lunchtime Art Talk where Aikichui uh, Onyoenyi uh, will present on Made in LA artist uh, Nilafar uh, Emiafar. Uh, Amami Afar, my apologies. Um, thank you guys so much for joining and um, see you guys next week for IK's talk, which will be really exciting. Bye.